All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, as you've heard from our lovely music, we're saying welcome. Wei Zolo, Akwaba, and Gona Rive. And that's how we say it in Ghana. Welcome to all of you for joining us for today. So we are starting now. And uh, we would like to let you know that our screen will be recorded. And you can always go back to it to refer to the session for the day. So welcome, all of you. We see you, Jay from Rhodes, everybody, you are welcome. And uh, we're starting now. So our, we have a second lovely music, but it's, uh, it's not so audible, so we move on to the main agenda for today. All right, thank you so much. Our topic for today, it's about um, designing for transformative learning in the post-pandemic. Uh, Ralitza, Ralitza. Yeah. Ralitza. Can you tell us who you are? Please introduce yourself, please, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Irene. I. In the two countries. And uh, I'm a designer by profession and I specialize in service design and also um, ed tech. So today, I like to um, share some of the experiences that we, we've, we've acquired over this period and how we can put part of that into designing for transformative learning when we return from the, from the pandemic. Okay, so that's, that's what the uh, presentation is all about today. So um, Irene, let me know if I can roll. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I would like to just tell people that uh, they can introduce themselves in the chat area, please. Um, tell us who you are, where you're coming from, where you're joining us from, we'll appreciate. Um, thank you so much, Ralitza, and yes, we can continue. Okay, thank you so much, Irene. All right, so let's uh, move on. Okay, so today um, the topic for our discussion is on EdTech, as you've all seen, and these are uh, the outline for today's uh, discussion. We'll be talking about these areas in the presentation today. So I'd like us to have a little bit about the context of uh, EdTech in Ghana, and as we go along, we can also hear from you to see what is happening in your country and how you are are managing your situation in your various countries in Africa. So EdTech uh, in Ghana, Ghana has uh, a variety of universities here. We actually have both the uh, government, which is the public universities, and then we have the private universities as well. Um, in this um, university landscape, we also have the polytechnics now being converted into universities as well. So. All of these um, categories have now become officially um, universities in this country. And you can see from the screen the various logos in the country. And then we have the various institutes that are also uh, being awarded degrees from the major government universities. But gradually, they are also becoming autonomous. And most of them all are doing a good job. Uh, and so we find ourselves uh, in this uh, pandemic situation. So the universities are spread across uh, the country. You can see the Ghana map. So these are the areas where you can find most of these uh, universities in the country. So um, on the side here, are the abbreviations for the schools. And you can read more about them online as well to sort of see what is happening in other parts of Africa. Then the mode of delivery is usually face-to-face uh, -face, and also some have blended learning and then others also have distant learning. And sometimes you can actually see that one university may have all of these uh, modes of delivery at the same time. And of course, um, it would be nice to hear from the others what is also happening in your, in your area. So we would like to hear a little bit um, in the, the text chats um, what are some of the teaching modalities in your university? So if you can tell us in the text chat, that would be great. So we welcome all of you. Feel free to tell us in the text chat what is happening in your 
in your universities, the mode of delivery. So just a few minutes, if we can harvest a few. Um, okay. Yes, uh, the pre-pandemic time. What, what, what were some of the mode of delivery in your pre-pandemic era? Okay, so John says uh, face to face distance learning and blended MOOC at UCC, that's University of Cape Coast, Ghana. And then, um, yeah, so we want to hear in the pre-pandemic era, what were some of the mode of delivery? Okay, so Aisha says it's 100% face to face in Kenya. Nice. And uh, Nicholas says it's face to face blended, and some courses are also online. Then Mary says uh, it's predominantly face to face. Okay. All right. So you can keep bringing it. So then uh, Mohammed says it's face to face in Ken USD. And Jesubash says face to face blended learning at the University of Cape Town. And Deban face to face blended learning. Fred simply says a face-to-face -face and blended learning at CPUT. Hello, Fred. Uh, thanks for joining us. So clearly we can see that uh, across the various uh, countries in, in Africa, we generally operating either face-to-face -face or distance education, some blended learning. So Mohammed says face-to-face -face blended learning at uh, Mansura University. Thank you for joining us all the way from Egypt as well. We welcome you and Joyce also from Estratini. Thank you. So it's a dual mode, face-to-face -face and distant learning. Nice. So let's um, look a little bit at uh, where we actually were. So this was where we were. This was how our, most of our conventional learning environment was. And uh, we either blend that with face-to-face -face or we also have the distant learning happening at the same time. And just uh, before that, we were having a good time with our teaching. Everything was going well, because that was how we have designed our learning environment before we went to the pandemic era. So just before the, uh, in the pandemic situation, we find ourselves, we all know that we went into lockdown and the situation was not funny at all. So suddenly we all have to be very creative and come up with uh, ways of, of, of teaching to, to support our learners. And this took us to, um, for us to move from the conventional learning environment into remote emergency teaching or emergency remote teaching. And in this um, situation where we currently find ourselves, we've gone virtual and we using online tools and in this scenario, everybody is doing their best to make sure that they reach all learners. And that's what we have to do. We, we're trying to explore the communication tools to make sure that we reach all our learners. And we currently also need to modify our content, not necessarily to design a new one altogether in this uh, emergency remote situation. We can modify the content that we have and then use that to deliver our lectures to our learners. And the goal here is to reach all learners. And in this case, we try to make sure, even if sometimes we need to print materials and get parents or put it at designated centers, learning centers for learners to pick their materials, we're doing that. And of course, um, learners do need a lot of motivation at this time because they are all working remotely. And since they are not in the conventional learning environment as we've all listed here, it means that occasionally we have to give them um, some kind of uh, communication to remind them that they have tasks to complete, etc., so that they can get their work done. Then the next point is for us to also give them constant uh, feedback so that and this can take either detailed feedback, constructive feedback, and it, carry, it goes on and on. Then with the assessment, we are all, we are not in normal times, and we know that uh, um, assessment we cannot always do it the way that we used to do it when we were in face to face. So of course we need to modify um, our assessments, yes. So towards the end, we can discuss these areas, how some of us are managing it, how are we going about it and what we can take forward from here. Then we have our well-being and also the well-being of our learners as well, because this is all very, very important. And because of this, um, 
we, we find ourselves in this difficult situation, we should know also that our learners are also facing the same. And of course, um, reaching all the learners becomes a bit challenging. And that's the, that's the tricky part in this, in this um, um, situation. So you can find the link there, there's more information on how we can go around this and how we can connect with our learners with all the challenges we have with connectivity. Then there's another point. We keep um, going on with our um, remote education right now, but are there some teaching strategies or uh, learning strategies that our learners can, can fall on to, to improve their learning in the, in remotely? So let's think around this. We can put the, the ideas in the text chat area because they also need to know and to help them continue with their activities um, remotely. So it's very good for learners to establish a personal um, learning environment to know how to the kind of online tools that they need, the devices, the tools that they are using for work and doing their exercises, resources that are available, and also how they can connect with their educators and, and uh, other course mates or learners uh, remotely to do their exercises. So all of these things are uh, come together within their personal learning environment to enable them um, get the best out of the teaching uh, or information that we are giving them out there to be able to meet their learning goals. Then we come to the opportunities and challenges. We all know that uh, we, are, we are in a very uh, uh, difficult situation, but we've all been very resilient and, and it's quite commendable. And this brings us a lot of opportunities, but at the same time, it also brings us so in this case, I would like um, a few of us to share your experiences um, about what has changed in your workplace within this remote emergency situation. And you can, you can tell us which side you see yourself sometimes, either if you are on side, side A or side B, or sometimes you find yourself in side B when you are also overwhelmed with feedback from learners or learners also be on site B and the educators be on site A or vice versa. So um, what specifically has changed in your, in your university or learning environment in this um, situation? So um, you're welcome to take the mic. Um, Irene would, would let you in <laughs> so that you share your experiences with us. We need a Please, if you like to speak, type M in the text chat area and let us uh, enable the mic for you so that you can speak with us. Or you're also welcome to type in the text chat what has, has changed, which side you, you see yourself mode. Okay, so Jesu Bash will go first. Um, yeah, so Irene, hi. Hi, thank um, you, Alyssa. Hi, hi. Hi, Jay. <laughs> okay. Nice to see you here. <laughs> nice to see you too. Maybe I'll start the video. So that oh, okay. Can... Hi, Jay. <laughs> oh. Okay, Ralitsa, um, answering to your point, I want others to also just, just kind of feed in. So hmm. in terms of the challenges, my one biggest concern is the well-being, mental well-being of the students. Every single day, I get emails from students, this long emails, the learning environment which you have mentioned, obviously because of the disparities in South Africa, you know, students are not really having conducive environments for like effective study. And as educators, we are really trying our best, you know, to provide support. Before this meeting, I had a meeting with one of my students of academic support. She's very appreciative. I use Zoom first time with a student because mindful of the connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. For me, that has been the biggest challenge. It's not the content as such. It's more about how do you really, you know, it's new to us, it's new to them as you introduce. So for me, it's about the well-being. How do you really accomplish that? So let me leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jade, and nice to see you again. Thank right. you. Thank you. All right, thank you for that uh, contribution. Anybody, anybody else wants to speak, please type uh, M in the text chat. And uh, um, Nicholas says uh, there is very diverse, uh, the situation is diverse. Some learners and lecturers are enjoying it. 
others frustrated or avoiding it completely. Sometimes you don't know. And then uh, Tony says that uh, I suspect that this is difficult for both educators and learners, big learning curve and change of practices for both, exactly. Okay, so um, are you ready to speak? I can see that your video is on. Um, okay, anybody else wants to speak? Um, may I speak? Just yes, briefly. yes, very nice to hear from you. <laughs> I think we, I think both, I've, I've been in a situation where I felt like both as educators and learners, we have both had situations where we are overwhelmed. Um, for learners in terms of um, all the work, the, the transition to online and the challenges just of connectivity and um, all that they now, th there's a whole lot now that they have to do. I think for us initially, the whole idea of engagement trying to engage students, especially for faculty, engaging them online um, meant that we also started giving them a lot of work, a lot of quizzes, a lot of assignments, and that really overwhelmed them. Um, for us as faculty, it's a lot of learning. And even while you're teaching, it's a lot of multitasking. You know, looking in the chat, uh, admitting students into the class. Uh, some people have uh, people to assist them, but it's a lot of multitasking and just uh, a lot of considerations to make because you're not seeing them physically the way you would and you'd be able to tell when they're engaged or when they're not. So you're not able to see that body language. So you're depending on just <laughs> what you're able to see from the chat and trying to respond to that. But um, it has also presented opportunities. Like I think for me, uh, the chat has been great in a sense that you are able to see a lot of student thinking in, like in, in one snapshot that you would not be able to have every child, every student in a class give you their thinking in a class setting that way. Okay, thank you so much, Mary, for, for your contribution. And I absolutely, the situation is also quite same, yeah? Um, I can see um, from Fred, Fred Simpe, please. You are welcome to also share your views. And yeah, so Fred, um, over to you, please. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. You are welcome to take the mic. All right, thank you. We hear from, you. Um, it's, it's the challenge of being isolated and then not really getting support when you are struggling. You know, we, we are faced with this situation where we are trying to improvise. But at the same time, you feel that, you know, the support in terms of, you know, if you get locked up somewhere where you could easily get assistance from maybe a colleague who may know more, which is non-existent, it makes it very difficult, um, particularly from my side. Um, that's a practical example for me. The, the challenge of students, like we've said already, connectivity is one um, the fact that it's also new to them, and they've also got to get through, you know, it, it makes it all very challenging. But like we've said already, I think the key is that we are trying to, to navigate our way out and, and possibly um, through, you know, activities like what is happening here. I feel that we will be able to improve and get to give our best as educators. That's true. Thank you so much, Fred, for, for that submission. And I think uh, Flora, Flora will go, then after Flora, we'll hear from Edward. And then um, I think quickly from Jose, Joseph and the rest, we will, we will move it a little bit towards the end um, where we will hear more of you. So Flora, over to you. And then we have Edward and then Joseph. The rest, please keep your comments coming in the text chat. And uh, we, will, we will share the, the transcripts uh, after the session. So, Flora, we, we, we ready? Flora, if you're ready, please speak up. Am I unmuted you already? Yes, you are audible, we can hear you. Thank you, Ralista. Uh, good afternoon. 
for us here in Tanzania, it has been a big challenge. Tanzania, it has been a big challenge because uh, of various issues. First of all, there is an issue of resources, uh, both technology, finance. There is also an issue of inclusivity, that is accessibility. Uh, accessibility was such a big problem for students mainly, but also for academic staff. And being a huge institution with more than 30,000 students, it was a, such a big challenge. So there are some few colleges who actually, it was kind of successful, as, but generally uh, uh, we have been mainly face to face. And of course, universities and colleges have reopened and we have gone back to mainly face-to-face. -face. So for us, uh, the challenge was actually uh, a huge one. We, could, uh, we, we couldn't say there is any success at all, except for like three colleges out of seven colleges. Thank you. Thank you Alisa. so much for that. And, um, interesting contribution over there. So, um, Dakora, please, can we hear you? If you have the mic, please enable your mic and let's hear you. Um, okay, good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, uh, Dakora. Um, well organized um, webinar. Thank you for organizing it. I, I have been attending quite a bit of this. Um, some among my colleagues, with my colleagues, and it's good to have a continental um, or, you know, a global kind of webinar to share the experiences. So, so since the beginning of the pandemic, um, for those who, who don't know, um, I'm based in South Africa in a very tiny university, which is new, and and the experience has been that there are few assumptions that have been made. And I like the input from what the Fred, the gentleman who spoke earlier about support. So few assumptions were made. And one from a resource point of view, um, some institutions and managers thought by giving resources and getting students connected and getting academic connected, the work will be done. And, and somehow that has proven not to be quite um, true because from where I am sitting, I'm in a small university where every student in, from this university has a laptop from day one. Every academic has a laptop from day one. So it should have been seamless to move completely online. But it didn't happen that way. And on top of that, the students have actually been given data to be able to connect wherever they are. But you still find that somebody has an equipment with data, but they have an issue with network or signal, for example, and you still have a challenge there. Then domestically, you find that students, um, some of Sorry, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Dakora, your sorry. sound is breaking. Okay, yeah, sorry. We hear you now. Locking. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay, so, so, so from a support point of view, it has actually been very difficult to even get the support that is there to some students because you, you can connect um, and I meet up with my students on Microsoft Teams and you'll find that they can't even talk because they're in a, either in a crowded space or they are sharing a room with other people and, and you want them to contribute to a class. And so all of that becomes a problem and you then find that some colleagues will then also get a panic 
How do I get them to respond? They are not responding. I am busy loading information. I don't get feedback. <clears throat> so, so it's very good that we, we, we actually share ideas. So I have spent quite a bit of time with colleagues um, sharing these ideas and experiences in terms of how we should. The one clear thing is that we cannot bombard the students and, and we can't and we can't expect magic from anyone. We need to learn to do, to achieve more with less by doing very minimal. And then you also have disparities around, among institutions. You know, minister have made pronouncements, resources and support have been made available. And some institutions are now just picking up um, to begin the first semester while some institutions have actually finished the first semester. And, and you'll find all of this disparity. So it's, it's quite a stressful situation when you figure out some of these things. And I think this is quite a useful discussion to be able to share these experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dakura, for that contribution, wonderful contribution there. I believe that we can all reflect on that. And uh, towards the end, we will surely take up the mic again and continue sharing our experiences. So it is evident that with these challenges, in as much as the educators are trying, the parents are trying, students may also be trying, as much as we try to get them to look at the bright side, some of them will see, still be flattening the curve when it comes to their grades. So the question is, how do we move from here and then go forward so that in, in future, when we find ourselves in such places, um, we'll be better prepared so that we can deliver much, much better information to our learners. So this is where um, we need to begin to look at uh, transformative um, online learning. And in this scenario, um, design becomes very, very relevant. So um, transformative learning normally looks at uh, a paradigm shift from what we normally know. So from all the submissions you've already made, it means that as we move forward, we need to change our perceptions and, and begin to um, change from our prior um, thinking and start looking at different ways of doing things through um, online learning. And it's evident that um, online learning uh, or uh, remote uh, emergency teaching right now is not the same as structured online learning. So we definitely need a little bit of paradigm shift in our learning spaces and also as we begin to transform our learning environments as well. So um, let's look at just a quick uh, bit about the transformative learning theory. There are so many learning theories out there, and, but as we move forward and we are thinking about transformation, we need to begin to look at the transformative learning theories as well. So it was started by Jack Mesero, who is an American sociologist. So he outlines um, 10 basic steps that one will go through, and this includes the disorienting dilemma, um, self-examination critical, um, assessment and uh, a recognition of where you are at the moment. It also looks at it also looks at uh, exploration. How do we explore in our learning environment and how that can transform our learning activities? So planning um, of a course of action, acquisition of knowledge, provision of uh, provisional trying of roles and then building of competence and self-confidence and also finally reintegration. So as we begin to look forward and changing our, our paradigm shift and looking forward to how to improve our learning environment, it's good for us to consider these things. And these can be categorized into four core teams and these are the disorienting dilemma section, critical reflection, um, rational dialogue with oneself, um, where was I coming from now with this new experience? How do we um, change our thinking? How do we go for a vote for educators and learners? And then we can eventually take an action and go forward. So in transforming our learning environment, this is where design comes in. 
learning experience design becomes very relevant in this, in this uh, situation. And we need to really look at how we can redesign our learning spaces. And this means that we need to look at how our content is designed, the structure, the timing, pedagogical strategies, what are the uh, pedagogical strategies available that we can draw from to redesign our learning activities, how frequent we want the assessment to be done. And then what technologies are available that we can use? Because right now in this emergency situation, we find ourselves using different types of technology. But of course, we are actually simply supporting teaching. But when it comes to really doing a transformative learning or going strictly online, we really need to redesign the learning experience. So this is important. And based on all that you said, the challenges that we experience, you can see that learners are coming from different environments. And we need to look at universal design principles that looks at all of these things and actually looking at bottom-up approaches. And usually we design and we do not um, always um, uh, care or think about all of these um, core principles because our learners to some extent are the beneficiaries. So we need to redesign the system thinking about all these things because some of them also have different educational backgrounds. They also have different attention spans and interests. They also have different language abilities, as well as coming from different cultural backgrounds. So all of these things come into play when we begin to look at universal design for learning. So these are additional core uh, things we need to look at when we are, we are beginning to think of moving online, that our learners can now comfortably work on their laptops and all, and all those challenges you are seeing, it's also to some extent because we've not designed the learning that way. So they are all trying to fit in. So moving forward, we need to look at all these things. And then the universal learning design looks at all these core principles, the representation, action, and expression, and then engagement. How do we engage the students very much actively in the learning environment? Then when it comes to our lesson plans, we need to look at, um, we can draw from Ghani's nine um, events of instruction. And this is how it looks like. You can um, refer to the link that will be shared in the text chat and you can read more about it um, to guide your instructional um, design when it comes to your lesson plan as well. And then we can also look at the Bloom's digital taxonomy, look at the key areas like remembering, understanding, applying, um, analyzing, evaluating, and then creating, so that we can actually structure the learning experience to follow these um, um, core um, levels for the learners to actually move it forward at each point, depending on what we want them to achieve at a particular level. Then when it comes to how we can implement um, um, e-learning or look at how we can um, redesign the learning process itself. We can also look at this popular model, which is the ADI model, and look at all the four uh, phases, five phases, and see how we can implement that in the design. So for example, in the design process, when we are beginning to move online, um, we need to look at the audience. And that's what, for example, we've spoken about earlier, about them coming from diverse areas. The content itself, how is it done? We need to look at redesigning the content. And for more information, we can look at um, some of the early presenters in this stream. They are uh, at the Image Africa website. We we'll see the PowerPoint for learning, see how to redesign the content, et cetera. Then we can develop the learning experience, actually prototype it, and eventually, we can implement it when we have proper connectivity and all of that. And this way, some of the challenges that we, we are seeing um, at this current situation of remote emergency uh, learning will be minimized a bit. Then once we implement that, we can also try to do some kind of evaluation. How is the cost like? How, how has have any of their behaviors changed? Are they able to achieve their core objectives, etc.? But actually, there are several models out there that you can explore. This is not the only one. And as you read more about it, you will see. Perhaps we can have a follow-up um, webinar on how to go through this step-by-step step to actually um, implement uh, 
um, e-learning in our various um, sections. So there's a little bit of video here, but I think that I will share the link for you so that you can watch it afterwards and we would spend a bit more time to uh, discuss our... Uh, okay, so let's look at uh, some online authoring tools. So once you've designed or you know how your learning should be structured and all, you also need to actually consider uh, some of the online authoring tools and these are some examples of them. You may have some already in your school that you'll be, you'll be working on and please feel free to type any type of uh, tools that you are using at the moment in your, in your universities in the text that would like to hear from you. So let's look at an example of um, how an online authoring tool looks like. You know, because there are so many tools out there and you have no careful, you'll be overwhelmed, but you really need to structure your learning and then you can now choose your tools as well to go with it. So let's watch this quick video. Learning is changing. Many modern learners now expect relevant, personalized, engaging content that they can access on demand anywhere. And any organization that delivers digital learning effortlessly and at scale really can improve performance and be more successful. But how can we deliver high impact learning at scale, control quality, and adapt easily to meet future demands? And how do you avoid the pain of traditional authoring to work together smarter? Meet Elucidat, a sophisticated authoring platform helps you create digital learning that scales simply and flexibly, enables smarter collaborative working, helps you reach complex global audiences and makes translation a breeze. Elucidat's daily dashboards let you analyze the impact of content as well as adapt and update it in keeping with new needs, trends, and technologies. Start creating and managing high-quality digital learning at scale with Elucidat. Right. Thank you so much. So now that was uh, elucidated. That that's an example of, of an online auction tool. In fact, they've not paid me to do any advert, but <laughs> I wanted to show an example of, of, of how one looks like. You can actually use this um, guide um, as to, to guide you in selecting your, your tools, okay? But there's more that you can also look at. So you can check out the price. Some of them are very expensive, how easy um, it is for one to use it. Can you actually um, synchronize it with other animation? Is it interactive enough? And even sometimes you even need to ask, how do you even add quizzes, etc. When it comes to people with also disabilities, that's the ADA, how are they able to assess that? Because remember that when you, it comes to learning design or actually designing a, a learning experience online, you want to consider everyone in it, okay? so. You need to think about all this. So this is a, a list to, to give you a start, but you can add more as you go along. Then let's um, reflect a little bit. Let's, let's rewind a little bit and see um, where we are going from here. So with all the conversations we've had earlier, it's clear that um, the pandemic has really uh, put us in a very, very difficult situation, but in as much as we are trying, um, we are doing our best to get there. The challenges are still there. And so once we are thinking about going online, there is a need for us to redesign the learning spaces. And although um, we are using tools like Zoom and all of that, it's, it's clear that it's, it's not enough. We will need a little bit more to be able to deliver better and quality education to our learners across Africa. And it has actually also in a way, despite the challenges too, it's giving us the opportunity to actually innovate. So the, the problem are, are there, but it's not, it's not, it's not completely lost. We, we still need to be hopeful and look forward. And whilst we are in this space, we begin to rethink and, and have a paradigm shift on how we can actually move forward from here. So the way forward. Um, we need to begin to rethink the, the, our learning spaces, as we've said. And one of the 
key things we need to look at beyond what we've already discussed is policy formulation from the national level and also from our institutional levels. We also need to standardize the guidelines so that we don't have different things happening at different places and, and it's chaotic. So that one department is not doing something different, the other one is not doing something different. But actually we can, in terms of the content, it can be modified per department within a particular university because the course is different. So we need some kind of a standardization for our online learning. And then we need to keep the transformative perspective because before we thought that we cannot work online or engage actively online, but now it's clear that we can actually do it. And this pandemic has really given us that. And both for learners and educators as well. We also need lots of training program for educators and also for some, to some extent, to, for subject specific areas, we might need some additional training program, not just for the online um, learning environment, because some courses may need some kind of physical simulation. How do we do that? And in that sense, we need the educators to also be trained. We also need technical experts, like we need um, designers to also come in to also assist with the content design because we know that some educators are doing almost everything at the same time. That, that is what really can be overwhelming at some point. And then we also need to have some instructional um, designers from all, all over. We also need to develop a lot of open educational resources to also support the learning and also open up the licenses so that people can remix, reuse, they can also share as long as they can also credit uh, people. And then uh, learners can also have the freedom that they need to learn at, at different locations. And we also need to standardize the learning management systems and all other tools so that we can actually um, make sure that everybody is on the same platform. And of course, as I've mentioned, we need a learning design and we can also look at the universal design learning model where we want to look at it top-down, um, uh, bottom-up approaches to also meet top-down top because we need, uh, we need to design from the learner's perspective. That is where we have the bottom-up. And then we also need policies. So we also look at the, both the bottom-up and also top-down approaches coming together. And I'm sure that we'll be able to come together at a very um, rich conclusion that will move us forward forward and beyond the pandemic. So um, when we find ourselves the next time having um, staff meetings and online meetings, we hope that it doesn't happen the corona style again. We will be hopefully be better prepared. So these are some resources. And yeah, thank you very much for listening. And then let's have your questions and contributions. You are welcome to take the mic and tell us um, what your thoughts are in terms of we going forward and, and the overall um, discussion we are having here. Okay, so we will open up the mic and uh, if you want to speak, you are welcome to do so. You need to type M in the text chat and yeah, we will, we will allow you to share your thoughts. So we like to hear from you, everyone. They, they can also raise their hand, then yes. it will be more visible. Hello. Hello. Hi, this is Pulani uh, from the National University of Lesotho. Uh, and I would like to find out uh, whether we're going to have time to reflect on this webinar uh, presentations, discussions, so that uh, we talk about the lessons that we've learned from being part of the webinar meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We can, we can always um, have a follow-up webinar. 
and we, we of course we would it would be nice for us to reflect on what we've discussed here and come back and share what we've learned and also at the same time beyond this it would be nice for us to see how um, some of these ideas have been taken forward so absolutely we will we would be able to organize a follow-up webinar for us to take the conversation so thank you very much for that. yeah so um can we get more? Yes, there's Taskin, Taskin, okay. and then Frida. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, okay. I'd like to know, so uh, I'm, I'm in South Africa, and right now there's a lot of debate between um, like leaving no learner behind. So because we have such high inequality, you know, some learners might not have any access to devices or data, and then other other learners can, you know, uh, pioneer ahead. So from an equity and inclusive perspective, how are people, how are different countries dealing with this to ensure that no learner is left behind? Okay, um, thank you very much. But is that, would anyone like to respond to that before we come in? Asking. Thank you so much. Okay, actually, I would, I would, whilst we're waiting for a few more to, to raise their mic, or um, in, our, in our context at the moment, um, we, we're actually doing our best, and what we decided to do, or what the university um, decided to do, was to make sure that all of us, we move from our regular um, private um, learning management system to the universities, management system. And the universities mostly have uh, learning centers across the country. So the directive, I'm speaking based on the directive that we had, was to uh, make all our materials available online. And at the same time, we tax the exams officers and coordinators at the different uh, centers to actually make the materials available at the center. So those who cannot access uh, materials online, can actually also go there and take the physical printed material. So that was how we did it. But um, from my earlier submission, you can see that um, for us to have a smooth run, like I was suggesting, we really need to design the learning experience. And that way, um, learners can go according to what we have designed them to experience. You know, so, so that way we, we can actually be, be assured that no learner will be left behind because universal design for all means that equal opportunities for all learners. Yeah. So thank you so much uh, for that. And Frida, you are next. Thank you, Ralitza. How are you? Hi, I'm good, Frida. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I liked what you mentioned about uh, transformative learning and how we can uh, design our learning, uh, looking at that lens of transformative learning. I want to add, uh, well, in the past, before COVID, uh, universities and maybe colleges uh, focused so much on the instructional part of designing learning. So it was more about what am I bringing to the, to the student, but there was very little about the aspect of conversation. And I think that has really been uh, um, expounded in, uh, during the remote and distance learning. Now you find that because you don't have that connection with a student face to face, you cannot take for granted conversations. And so uh, what, what I would want to add about transformative learning is uh, to improve our design the learning design, we have to enhance how conversations are being made between teachers and students, uh, students between and, and their own students, how diversity, as you mentioned, and, uh, and, and, the, and the attitudes towards learning and how you bring everyone together. So, the, well, my, 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 my focus would be even for that lady who mentioned from TZ that they have already gone back to the old face-to-face -face learning, but now how do you now enhance conversations 
and improve and make people more transform, uh, transform, transform, uh, transformative. <laughs> uh, yeah, beyond just receiving the content and the, and the instructions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Frida, for that submission. And I think that your question, your last question about how do we um, enhance their transformative uh, learning when we are even in face-to-face, -face, like I mentioned, you see, every scenario you find yourself, I'm, I'm speaking from the point of view as a, as a service designer, you, you actually have designed it that way. So anyhow you experience it means that that was how you allowed it to be. So if we actually need to make the best out of the, the learning environment, even when we are in face-to-face, -face, we, we actually need to have a paradigm shift of how we engage with our, with our learning. But that will be decided based on the context we find ourselves. So we may not have a hard, fast rule at the moment, but depending on the situation you find yourself, you begin to look at how to make your learning experience different because we also need the learners to know that it's not always that the situation will be in the conventional space as we experience it you know so that that is where we can begin the conversation and and the essence of all of this is for us to rethink how we we can we can reimagine our our learning environment you know so thank you so much for that frida and then rosalind can we hear from you hi good Good afternoon, everyone. It's Rosalind from the Durban University of Technology. Uh, very interesting conversations and lobby presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I just want you to respond to the previous um, uh, attendee who spoke about how are we supporting students so that no student is left behind. And I just want to share some of the things that we are doing at the Durban University of Technology. So we are supporting students, um, firstly, to use the online platforms because we find that lots of our students are struggling with logging on and simple things about navigating the spaces. Um, and at DUT, uh, we're using Moodle this year, so it's something new for all students. So we do have e-tutors and they are working with our students and they have been training them to use the LMS. Um, we've also been providing uh, support for staff as well on a weekly basis on training on Moodle and also on uh, curriculum conversations. So we, uh, we have been engaging with staff on different aspects of developing um, the, pro the online learning experiences for students. We have also provided data. It's been a long, long uh, battle with the data, but finally we did receive good news I think it was yesterday that all students will receive their data bundles. Um, and what we're doing, we're using um, Moodle for more asynchronous learning. So we're placing um, um, our information on Moodle, but we're also using uh, Microsoft Teams for synchronous learning, synchronous teaching. So uh, maybe a lecture once a fortnight, just to have that kind of contact with students and MS Teams is uh, relatively low bandwidth as well. And I, I think what's important, what has come up from our conversations with staff as well, is that this is an ideal opportunity to start looking at how we can transform the curriculum. And whilst we're changing things to go online, we also need to transform and decolonize lots of the stuff that we have. And just one last point. Um, if we use uh, the LCT lens, the legitimation code theory, I know uh, some people, we did have um, a meeting yesterday and they were speaking about what type of um, NOAA are we trying to develop? So certain disciplines are more NOAA specific. For example, it's, um, you're developing a particular abilities and knowledges uh, for that student. So the art is more NOAA based and the sciences is more knowledge-based. So when we're putting things online, we need to look at our discipline and we need to adjust our online teaching accordingly, depending on the type of graduate that we want to develop in our specific discipline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosalind, for that. And, and actually summing everything up for us 
And yes, absolutely. I mean, you've, you've said it right there. Thank you so much for that. And I think that uh, Joseph, earlier you wanted to speak. So we will give you the chance for you to speak. Joseph Amel, are you there? And after, after that, we have uh, Mary Ocheng, who has has a hand up for a while. So Okay. All right. So Joseph? All right. Thank you very much, Alisa. Um, it's a good presentation. Um, I salute you for the good work you are doing. Um, what I like is the fact that we are having a conversation. And the conversation seems to, even though we are different, we are from different diaspora within Africa, it seems that our issues are the same, our challenges are the same. And so I feel strongly that we need a, a very serious conversation where we will connect, we will rethink, and we will fine tune our approaches within the context of Africa. I believe that COVID-19 has brought a lot of things to the fore and Africa has been hardly hit. It's all because we were not prepared. We, we by our nature, we seem not to do a lot of planning and forecasting. And so as educators, I feel strongly that this is a time for us to re-engage, rethink, um, just as you said, transformative learning. Let's think about how can Africa within the next 20, 30 years engage strongly such that things of this nature, when it hits us again, will be better prepared. And so my advice to all of us is that as educators, we need to begin to do a lot of rethinking, re uh, a lot of conversations so that policies, decisions, approaches, curriculum, pedagogy, will all be fine-tuned within the African context. And that at the end of the day, the very best will come from Africa. So I thank all colleagues. Um, I'm speaking from Otenka University. There's a lot we are also trying to adapt to. It's not been easy, but we know that we will definitely um, have a, 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 the best way out. And so thank you all. Um, Ralisa, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, we have another person who wants to speak, please. Mary, um, um, you're welcome. Mine is, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has really been informative. And I think despite the challenges that we have gone through in uh, moving to online uh, instruction, I think it has also given us a lot to rethink um, that if we are really honest and diligent about, um, overall our teaching will be better even when uh, things open up and we go back to what people are calling the new normal. Um, some of the things we might have to rethink is the heavy emphasis on examinations where exams carry so much weight. And that's just my thinking. But I just want, what I wanted to just find out from people here, what are you doing about examinations? That is my question. Okay. So there is a question on the floor by Mary. What are we doing about examinations? Can we hear, it'd be nice to hear what everyone is doing. You can, you can actually, type in the text chat area. Yeah, so let's take the next. And um, Oyetola, Oyetola, you can, you can take the mic. Hello. Hello. Ekani. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Ekani. Oh, you are well done, Debra. Well <laughs> Sincerely, that was a nice presentation. Thank you. I'm um, Oyetola from Obafemi Udo University, Belief in Nigeria. Mm. Sincerely, in order for us to perform it effectively as expected when it comes to online teaching and learning, we as educators, we need to put in place and we also need to 
take note of some constraints. Because, for instance, in my university now, there are many constraints, there are many challenges. Even many students, they do not have access to their individual personal computer. And that has been a huge problem. And uh, I think it varies from one country to another, depending on the economic strength of each of the country. I think one of those things we must take note is that uh, we must try and inform our government. We should let them know the importance of this thing because uh, we here in Africa, we are still struggling compared to our counterparts uh, throughout the world. We are struggling and we are still trying. But I think uh, this uh, pandemic has uh, really opened our eyes and it has even informed us that we need to buckle up because education now is, is going digital. So we, 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 we cannot uh, do without it. So we have to take note of those things. Uh, we, we have to tell them. So for instance, now in my university, we will make sure that we take the administration, what they can do in order for the students to be at least digital literate a little bit, in order for us to be able to venture more into online uh, teaching. I've been trying to teach online in my classes, but for the undergraduate, it has not been easy. Uh, you know, but for, for the postgraduate, it, 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 it's, it's a little bit easier, but uh, there are still challenges, there are still constraints. And, and uh, the major one is the financial aspect of it. For instance, now, internet facility. Uh, the bandwidth here yeah, is, uh, is an issue. Is an issue. So I think those are some of those things we need to we need to take note in order for this assignment to be effectively carried uh, carried out. Thank you for that presentation, Alista. Thank you so much, uh, my brother from the west. <laughs> okay, so. Um, I, I can see that there are some few uh, feedback from the floor. Um, Yusuf is saying, I prefer take home examination. It helps students to do a lot of research and produce original text. And Rosalie says at DOT, we have moved most models uh, to continuous assessment. Um, Nicolas says, uh, no, that's from, uh, Nicolas says take home exams and other forms. We have deans, et cetera, looking at an assessment guide adapted from UCT and which at the moment and departments are making decisions that make sense for their disciplines. Yes, exams can finally go away. That's what um, Dr. Korea says. So, I mean, we can keep the conversations coming. Every, every um, project or department is different. And so because of that, there will be different ways that people will tackle um, different assessments. We also have some webinars in image which deal strictly with uh, with assessment you can also look at that and um, see how you can draw from that and see how you can manage your assessment um, back in your various places so as we keep the contributions coming there are a few more people to take the mic you're welcome to do so um, but uh, officially our meeting has ended at one but please keep the contributions coming you can contact um, us or me in, on this uh, address and you can also follow me on the various social media platforms and at image africa this is our contact uh, address as well please follow us and join our youtube channels and see more information over there and we also uh, will put up uh, a feedback um, what do we call it? A feedback um, questionnaire for you to tell us about your experience today. And if there's a need for follow-up also, let us know. And we also share the link to our Image Africa webinars as well. So please join us. But we are here. Please, we'd like to hear more from you if you have anything to say. The slide uh, tasking, the slides will be made available and then you can access it online as well. Yeah, please, if there's anybody who wants to take the mic, Please do so, we are here, but we wanted to officially let you know that yes, we've come to the time that we need to, but um, yeah, please keep the conversations coming. <laughs> Let's hear yes. this. Uh, Nana, Avia had a hand up, uh, so perhaps you can give us some time to speak. 
Yes. Hello. Hi. Hello, Nana, Hi. Professor. Oh, Raliksa, you've done such a great job. Wonderful presentation. You've Thank done you so much. well. Thank you so much, bro. Um, the issue here is perhaps with me and my colleagues, I speak for a lot more people. Here we are used to face-to-face, -face, some online work, but we have to develop, design and develop our own content. Then we've got to do the uploading and we've got to do the teaching online. So what's the difference? We show our faces both in the face-to-face -face as well as in the videos. That's what we've been used to. Suddenly we are caught up in this race where what we did not design for online uh, uh, facilitation has quickly to be repackaged and put online. It's been a very hectic time and it's still very difficult. I think if we can have more of these webinars that um, Africa, we can share our own ideas and we can take the conversation up, we would learn a lot more from others. But my major issue is that we need instructional developers, content developers, to work with the curriculum uh, designers, such that we can also benefit a lot more from what we do, rather than be the jack of all trades that we actually have become now. Thank you very much for this eye-opening uh, webinar presentation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof, for, for that contribution. Thank you so much. Absolutely, we will need uh, specialized personnel across board to, to work together. But of course, yes, um, we keep doing the little that we can whilst we prepare for other professionals to join us. So anything more, we would like to hear from members from the floor. Agnes? You want to say something? There, there is a hand up from Steve. So after Agnes, we can have Steve. Okay. If you, if you don't mind Hello. to have your video on, you can put it on now um, when you speak. And then you can switch it off when you finish. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Steve. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah I think um, my video has been disabled, but I want the educators to do something about um, this issue. We, we have, I have some friends in West Africa, Ghana, per se, that they don't have um, network or reception that they can even um, connect to this transformation learning online. So with this issue, I want the educators to take all this into consideration so that we can all benefit from it. Yeah, so that is the small um, issue that I want to raise. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Steve, for, for that contribution. We are very pleased that uh, you've spoken from a student uh, perspective because we really wanted to, to bring the students also into the discussion. Um, and thank you for that. Um, it's clearly noted by everyone here in Ghana and you can also see that across Africa, people are also having similar things. So um, we will work on that and ensure that in, in future, future events, we will make sure that uh, most of you would, would have access. But, Definitely, it's quite a challenge in a remote emergency situation, and, and, and we, are, we really, really empathize with all of you. We know that most of the things you experience, even we as educators, we also experience that. So, point well taken, Stephen. Thank you so much for, for being here. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Too. Thank you, Steve. So, um, Agnes, you want to say something? Okay. 
Okay, so while we wait for, for Agnes to prepare, is there anybody else uh, with a hand up? Okay, so hey to my day. Hi, Jay. Hi, Alyssa. Hi. Okay. First of all, well done on a brilliant presentation. You really put everything into perspective. So the points which I would like to cover is what we have done for this last hour is like we adopted a social constructivist approach. So as educators, we came together and based upon this current context, based upon what you have presented to us, we making meaning out of it, right? And now the collaborations as a lot of other colleagues have mentioned, it's quite critical within Africa we can share resources. Emerge Africa, hats off to Emerge Africa. I've been attending uh, quite a few seminars only after the lockdown period. But before that, you know, you work bound, you get caught into your own cocoon. So I really appreciate the incredible work Emerge Africa is doing. And also uh, it's inspiring to hear from, uh, it feels like, you know, it's an authentication. I'm not alone in this journey. There are other people across the continent who go through the same stuff. So I really appreciate and keep up the great work. So yeah, I see this is like, it, it needs to be an ongoing thing and uh, there will be kind of, you know, it can be disseminated, you know, across the whole continent, especially in South Africa. I mean, it looks like, except for me and Tony, we're the only two UCTS. I'm speaking under correction. We got how many staff within UCT? It's a missed opportunity, you know, and that's how I see it. So let me leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, you are not alone. And the situation is happening across board. And that's why we are here. So um, let's keep the conversation going. And if there are specific um, areas that you like us to follow up with webinars on that, yes, you are welcome to also let us know. And we are happy to do so. And yeah, you are also welcome to, to, to share your experiences whenever you are ready. You let us know. Okay. So I don't know if um, Agnes, do you want to speak? Yeah, I want to say something. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi, Ned. Hi. We can hear Hello. you. You can hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, please, I don't know. Is there any mix up in the time? Because um, what I was sent to my mail was 3 p.m. And I logged in about 2.59 and expecting to join the webinar. But what I'm seeing now is like the webinar is already concluded. Is there any mix up in the time? I'm calling from Nigeria. I'm a... Uh, a PhD student in Educational Technology of the University of Rio. So I don't know what's happening. I want, I want to be clarified, please. Okay, um, thank you so much, Agnes, for that. The time was actually set for South African time, 3 p.m., and then Ghana time, um, 1 p.m. And I think that the difference between Ghana and Nigeria should be about, I'm not too sure, but um, it should just be about 30 minutes or an hour, right? So you were actually supposed to check the difference between the Ghana time and then the Nigerian time. But do not worry, Agnes. Um, the session is recorded, so you can actually go back and look at it, and then you can catch up with all that you've, you've missed at the beginning. So nothing is really lost. So yes, of course, we would have loved to have so much of your contributions, and yes, you must always check the, the time zones um, with the time that is set because normally it's originally set with South African time and then the speaker's time is also the next time you see on it. But thank you so much for joining us. We really, really welcome your participation and hopefully the next time we, we hope that um, we don't confuse you with the time and we will have a great session to hear your voice because we can see you have so much to talk for us. And yeah, we would love to hear from you the next time. Thank you so much, Agnes. And I think someone else wanted to talk. Aisha?
Hello. Uh, good Hi. afternoon. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I'm speaking from Nigeria. And I would like to maybe add a small contribution to what Jay had said regarding the social constructivist theory. Because uh, normally here, basically in Nigeria, I think uh, most part of the students and the teachers uh, uh, lay most stress and emphasis on behaviorist uh, theory. But due to the pandemic and prior to that also, I think there, is a, there has been a paradigm shift um, from the behaviorist perspective uh, and then the, uh, to the constructivist. So there is need, I think, for the instructors now and the students alike to uh, maybe collaborate and see if they can be more of a constructivist oriented uh, than the behaviorist or the cognitivist, cognitive, cognitivist, I think. And um, there is need also for the learners and, uh, sorry, instructors to, I think, uh, modify their content to suit the, the technological advancement now and uh, the need also for us to, I think, go back to the dream board as you said, and you mentioned earlier, in terms of uh, policy formulation, to see what can be done to enhance the learning, because mostly now the, the, the teaching and learning are basically uh, teacher-centered and not otherwise. And there is need for that paradigm shift. I think we need to stress that so that uh, it will reach to the authorities involved. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aisha, for that. And yes, indeed, we really do need a paradigm shift as we've been discussing all this well. And also, yes, for the learners, for us to also get their views as well. So um, thank you so much. Any more that um, we would like to contribute, but as um, we have members here, please keep your comments coming. The video is available on YouTube. You can find the link in the text chat. And so then, um, Agnes, you can, you can watch that. And yeah, please feel free to, to give us your feedback on the webinar. And if there are specific topics that you want us to um, treat again, please let us know as well. So um, thank you so much. And OK, Stephen has his hand up again. Stephen, yes, uh, let's hear from you, Stephen. I think it's missing in action. Um, okay. Yeah, right. well, perhaps as, as, as Stephen gets ready, Ralita, this is Irene. I just okay. wanted to know what is that one thing that you can tell anyone that is struggling with design, you know, uh, educational design? Um, what, what is that one thing you tell them uh, at this time in point where everybody is struggling? Um, uh, what advice do you give? Okay. I will say that, um, first of all, you keep calm. And there's one thing about working with technology, when you panic, it never works. <laughs> because it seems that sometimes technology seems to understand us or whatever. When you panic, it doesn't just work. We need to keep calm. And when it comes to the design part, um, learning actually has to be designed and we don't need a sophisticated software to make it happen. You look at your context and see what works. So, like I said, there are so many altering tools out there, and, but you don't need to look, uh, use high-end tools to make your learning happen. You can use what works that learners can engage with because at the end of the day, um, the learners are more or less like your, your, your clients that you want, to, you want to satisfy. So if you do something that you cannot engage with it, then you, you are not achieving your, your goal. So um, for now, we are in this situation, but we will definitely get over that. And once we are out of it, let's just know that um, learning can be fun for us as educators and at the same time for the, for the learners as well. Thank you very much. Over to you, Irene. 
Uh, so, um, are you still able to speak, Steve? Or I think Nalini has his hand. Yeah. Nalini. Hi there, guys. Hello. Can, Hi. Okay. Go for it, Steve. All right. Um, I think that um, this online um, edu educative transformative um, learning is um, a means that will educate both the practical aspect and then the theoretical aspect. So um, we are um, graphic design student, we deal in practical aspects. So, in this online um, educative aspect, how well can you um, use to reach out to the te technical educative aspects so that to help those who are offering practicals to get whatever that you want to teach or whatever information that you want to send to them? And also, um, help them to respond back to you. So I want the educators to um, find a means to do something about that. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you so much, Steve, for that. And I believe that um, all educators here would, would reflect on that. And of course, uh, we will all take it forward on that. So let's uh, hear from uh, Na, um, another person had a hand up, Nalini. Hi, Ralitza. I can. Um, thanks. Thanks so much. I actually was attracted to the um, when I saw the call um, to the idea of transformative learning and especially Mesero's ideas about transformative learning. So thank you very much for bringing that to uh, you know to to address issues of um, how we deal uh, with teaching and learning during the pandemic. Because I think what um, COVID-19 is actually doing is it has actually forced us to stop and to rethink what we have been doing and taking for granted um, all this time in, in higher education. And I think transformative learning is actually um, bringing about the kind of mind shift that is needed as we engage with what we are calling at the Durban University of Technology, a multimodal uh, form of engagement with our students. Because transformative learning brings on the ideas about um, disrupting our taken for granted assumptions. And, and I think we're at a, uh, at a juncture now where we are disrupting our taken for granted assumptions about learning, about, for example, what is the purpose of having an exam, about who our students are and how they learn, about our context and about, uh, you know, contextualizing our teaching and learning. So, so I want to say thank you. Um, it's the first Emerge Africa um, uh, webinar that I'm attending and, and I, I look forward to others. Uh, what we have been stressing and talking about at our university for the last few weeks uh, where we've um, we've started what we call a curriculum conversations with our academic staff is the idea of dialogue and collaboration. And that is so critical across universities in South Africa and Africa and across. So, so this is another forum that is allowing and enabling that dialogue. So thank you very much for bringing that uh, and encouraging the dialogue and sharing of practices. And so from our side, uh, what we are doing at, at, at DUT at the moment is we're using what is known as, uh, and, and colleagues have been asking, you know, how do we engage in instructional design. So we are using what is known as the storyboard. Um, so I'm not sure if colleagues are familiar with it. Some, some may be full, familiar with Judy Salmon's idea of uh, the Carpe Diem learning design um, approach, which one can use. Um, but we, we are using the idea of the storyboard. So we look at the storyboard of an, of an entire uh, module and we can, you can plot the storyboards of each of the modules for your program and then we, we then we can see clearly what we can put into our online modes what we can hold on later on when we meet our students face to face so that has been quite a useful thing for us but um, a colleague um, from UNISA has brought in also the idea of storyboarding and activity so we've taken uh, you know staff have taken an activity and storyboard it, you know, in terms of 
all the different aspects in terms of objectives, assumptions that we are making, the kinds of assessments and notional hours. And I think this has been quite critical. And, and, and the three things that he brought to the table was the idea of, you know, he spoke about the three A's, the access, the affordability of the, the technology and the application. And we thought that these are, are nice things to look at as you are designing for an online mode. So I just want to contribute with those kinds of aspects. I'd be happy to share and talk to other colleagues if anybody would be interested in talking about more about the storyboarding and activity. I thought I'll just share that with those that are interested in how do we engage in instructional design. So thank you once more, Relitza, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Nalini. That was that was awesome contribution. I mean, all of you here, you've done you've done amazing job, and the storyboard thing you spoke about is really really real because it actually allows um, us to actually visualize how the learners will experience the, the learning activities, and that was really really a good one. Thank you so much, and you are all welcome to drop us an email if you have anything to share. Please, please, please feel free to drop us an email and then we will look at that and, and provide the opportunity for you to share some of the activities you are doing within your space so that we can all um, hear what is happening in other parts of Africa. So Nalini, thank you so much for offering um, to, to, to share your experiences with us. Thank you so much. And I believe- Pleasure, sure. pleasure. Sure. All love to do that. Thank you so much and thank <laughs> Thank you so much. So over to you, Irene. Oh, thank you so much, Ralitza. I don't even know where to start to thank you. Um, we are so happy that you had the time to prepare for this uh, session. We appreciate you. Um, we hope that when you give us feedback, uh, you can tell us uh, which other part of educational technology you'd like us to present on and we'll find a presenter for that. Uh, please join us on our Facebook page. I've shared the, 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 the link uh, in the chat. And also please give us feedback in the feedback form. Um, the session was um, uh, recorded directly on YouTube and, we'll, and also the link was shared on Facebook. So we have both on our, on our Facebook page. So please follow that if you got here when the presentation was already done. Again, we thank you, Ralitza. We, we thank you so much. I just wanted to share that the next, um, the next, the next uh, uh, webinar will be on Friday uh, with uh, Professor Marwala uh, from uh, the University of uh, Johannesburg. And you'll be talking on the um, 4IR and what it means for African universities. If you have time, please join us at the same time as today. That is 3 p.m. South African time. Please try and convert your times accordingly. That said, I wish to thank you, Ralitza, a lot, a lot. And thank you, everybody, for coming. And have a good evening, good afternoon, and um, a good night, whoever is <laughs> uh, a little later in the evening. Thank you. And have a uh, uh, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you all. Thank you so much, Irene. Bye, everyone.